This week on the Men at the Movies podcast, we try out our Boston accents and talk about goodwill hunting. We were created to desire two things, intimacy and purpose, but we can't pursue our purpose without being grounded in intimacy. Like Will, we have an amazing gift, but the pain of our past leaves us incapable of using that gift in a way that matters. Thankfully, Will had Sean, Skyler, and Chucky to help him navigate through the brokenness to find healing and restoration. So how do you like me now? And let's discover God's truth in this movie. The movies and stories we love are gateways to see ourselves and God in new ways. Every great story borrows its power from a larger story. The story that's written on our hearts and woven into the fabric of our very being. Hello and welcome to the Men at the Movies podcast. My name is Paul McDonald and joining me not, not on the Zoom stream, but on this other Riverside app we're using, (laughs) we're trialing some new stuff, is my buddy Britt. Hey Britt, how you doing today, man? I am doing really well, man. How are you? Doing well as we were, we've spent about 45 minutes talking. I know. (laughs) Before we even hit the record button. And it's almost like we actually like talking with each other. We, we're not yeah. just doing it for a podcast. We actually really like actually just talking. with <laughs> Right. I was thinking about it. I was like, you know, we haven't, we haven't gotten together in a few weeks because yeah. we've been on vacation. You've been traveling and, and mm. just the Swiss cheese just sometimes doesn't want to line up, <laughs> but it's like, oh yeah, I really enjoy talking to you. Yeah, man. And uh, so it's, as. You know. Even right before we came on, I was like, man, this is like a, a, a cup of cool water to a parched tongue. Yep. Good uh, stuff. That doesn't sound weird at all. <laughs> so all today, right. so today we're talking about goodwill hunting and in, in order to honor everyone, be aware that apparently they curse a lot in Boston. Uh, apparently. <laughs> so the clips will be spicy you know i i've been to boston (laughs) and and not and uh it was more in the spring not in the fall as um they say in the veggie tales song but i don't remember people cussing this much Uh, i did go to (laughs) i did go to the dunkin donuts i did do that which they they feature in the movie yeah, there, there are Dunkin' Donuts everywhere in Boston. Like that's no, yeah. that is no joke. It is ev- they New are England every- for sure runs on Dunkin'. Oh my gosh! And and I've been to Boston twice and been out and about with people, not necessarily Christians in some cases. I just don't remember people cussing like this. I you know you probably didn't don't. go down to the town down to I, Southie. I. I <laughs> I, I don't think I did, uh, <laughs> but I. It, it's one of those things where it's like I've been around people who cuss a lot, but again, I've been part of the military, not in the military, but I've been around the military. Like I get it, but it's so funny when some of these movies are like the F word, every other word, and I'm like, yeah, like this. You know, I think they do. It's just nobody we hang out with. Maybe I don't obviously know. we we need to expand our our friendship repertoire. I need, I need more f bombs in my life. Is that what you're trying to tell me <laughs> you well, need more f bomb f bombs. Yeah, that's what um, that's what our life needs. So this movie is 1997. This is actually 90s. We're not. It's not like we're going modern or 80s. Like we're kind of in the middle this time. Uh, and uh, Robin Williams won an Oscar. Uh, I don't. I don't know if yeah. this was his only or first. It was. I think it was his only Oscar. Now, it was supposedly written by Matt Damon and Ben Affleck. I have seen some interviews that question this. That that say that Ben Affleck and Matt Damon and they won an Oscar for this as writers. By the way, for the screenwriting, that, for screen or as the as yeah as a screenplay. Mm-hmm. They came up with the idea, but there were several hired writers, screen uh, screenplay doctors, they call them in Hollywood, where they would come in 
and beef up the screenplay. They make it whatever. So I don't, but we'll never know if, how true that is because they didn't put their names on the, the bill. Um, but they got Robin Williams. Part, part of why they got this movie made is they got Robin Williams to sign on to do it. And then the studios got involved and Gus Van Zandt directed it. And Danny Elfman did the music. Um, you got the guy from Thor. The doctor guy from Thor is the, the professor in this one. Stars guy oh, yeah. or whatever is it. So it, it, this is a classic. This is one of those when it's on in the afternoon on TBS or TNT or whatever, like it's just one of those, okay, I'm, I'm probably just going to watch the rest of this. It's just, it moves really well. It's, it's just a very, very well done movie. It really is. And that again, makes it really challenging for us <laughs> right? because we, we, talk about we don't want day. to, this could be, again, this, this wasn't that long of a movie, but our podcast could go longer. <laughs> right. Um, like it was interesting. We could talk about Will and Skyler and their dynamic. We could even talk about, uh, you know, Professor Lambos and his assistant. Oh man! Because like, just the the characters are so interesting. Like all of them. Yeah. Except for maybe the blonde ponytail guy. He, he was uninteresting. He wasn't supposed to be interesting. He was supposed to be. <laughs> He's supposed kind of to a be jerk. a douche. <laughs> um. There you got Casey Affleck in there and uh Yeah, you do. They're, they're you know, j- the characters are awesome. So if yeah. you haven't seen this movie in a few years, check it out. Go see it. You know, after the kids are in bed, use the earmuffs or on TNT when they or, Yeah, there you bleep, go. Where they where they scratch out. those out. Um because what we're going to talk about, we're going to focus on uh, obviously fo- focus on will. And this is, this movie is now, you know, 20 something years old. We're not going to go into the plot. Um, but what we want to talk about is will his, his search for his identity and how the different characters, specifically Sean Skyler and Chucky sort of help him to f- realize and discover who he was really called to be. So we're going to start in the middle. We're, we're going to jump right into the clips because we've got some good clips. Um, and because they're, they're so good, they, they are a little bit on the longer side. So we're going to ask you guys for a little bit of grace with that as we dive in, because we want to set the stage. You've got, we, we, we're looking at Will. And I'm going to say Will is us in this scenario. He's been hurt by life. He's got a tremendous gift. But he's not really living it. But as with en- as with us, like this sort of this podcast came about because we had stuff we just wanted to talk about and had to do. Will was a genius. He could do stuff very few people could do, and it just had to come out of him. But just like with us, there is some broken pieces, some fractured, as you talked about previously, the orphan spirit. Yeah. And figuring out a way to navigate those sort of split, the ambivalence, really the ambivalence of will, of being a genius and a and an orphan, uh, is really what this movie's about, and how these three characters will walk him through that process. Yeah. So here's where will is like us is, and there are different degrees. Well, you know, when we talked about the orphan spirit there are different degrees of it there's a continuum of sorts but here's where he's like us as christians we have been given the same holy spirit that raised jesus from the dead like we have been given an amazing phenomenal gift like the lottery as it were as it they talk about in the movie like it's miraculous. But what the enemy tries to do is to hurt us somehow and get us to hide it. Get us to misdirect it, to hide it somehow. And that's what has happened to Will, is the, is the pain and the abuse of his past has made him distance himself from really using his gift 
in a way that matters. But he's been given this great gift, but and, and that's 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 what the devil does. The devil's like, you can't use this, you shouldn't use this. The system, the system's awful. They're just gonna abuse you, and you don't need all right, and like like all the lies based on the trauma from the past, which we all have to some degree, right? We all have that. And and that's where he's like us. And what we need is to explore that, like Will needed to do in this movie. And but it wasn't just that exploration. Like like, like you said, I think it's uh, it's really good, Paul. Like we he needed all three of these influences. Yeah. Because they all really pretty much they all pretty much do the same thing, which is they think more of him than he does of himself. Mm. And don't we need that? Isn't that what we need? Um, and that's and it's, that's why it's such a beautiful movie. So we're going to jump into the second session between Sean and Will. Sean, the Robin Williams character, and Will, played by Matt Damon. Well, and, and just, just to kind of set it up... W- Will has been manipulating everybody. He's manipulated right. every every therapist. He says he doesn't need therapy. And how often do we say the same thing? No, 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 I'm good. Right? Where God or the church or somebody is trying to dig deep and say, well, what's really going on? And we just, yeah. so that, and so, and there's been a, a conflict where he kind of hurts Sean. And so then that's where this Amazing yeah, and it was a beautiful, that first session was awesome. As you see, Will just constantly deflecting, deflecting, f- looking for, for Sean's weak spots. Then he found it, and triggered it. that reaction where, you know, Will grabbed him by, like, pushed him against the wall. He's like, basically, keep my wife's name out your mouth. Yeah. You, that's probably the last <laughs> time we'll be able to use that. <laughs> no, <laughs> it totally that's, works. <laughs> And so this, but he agrees to meet with him again. And so they go out, they're sitting by a lake or a river and, and watching the, the swans and stuff. And, and Sean talks to him and he says, you know, I, I really spent a lot of time thinking about what you said. It really, really mattered to me. I thought about what you said to me the other day about my painting. Uh, I stayed up half the night thinking about it. Something occurred to me. I fell into a deep, peaceful sleep and haven't thought about you since. You know what occurred to me? No. You're just a kid. You don't have the faintest idea what you're talking about. Why, thank you. It's all right. You've never been out of Boston. Nope. So if I asked you about art, you'd probably give me the skinny on every art book ever written. Michelangelo. I know a lot about him. Life's work, political aspirations, him and the Pope, sexual orientation, the whole works, right? I bet you can't tell me what it smells like in the Sistine Chapel. You never actually stood there and looked up at that beautiful ceiling. Seen that. If I ask you about women, Probably give me a silver, so your personal favorites. You may have even been laid a few times. But you can't tell me what it feels like to wake up next to a woman and feel truly happy. You're a tough kid. When I ask you about war, you probably uh, throw Shakespeare at me, right? Once more into the breach, dear friends. But you've never been near one. You've never held your best friend's head in your lap and watch him gasp his last breath looking to you for help. When I ask you about love, you'd probably quote me a sonnet. But you've never looked at a woman and been totally vulnerable. You've known someone that could level you with her eyes feeling like God put an angel on earth just for you, who could rescue you from the depths of hell, and you wouldn't know what it's like to be her angel, to have that love for her be there forever, through anything, through cancer, 
and you wouldn't know about sleeping sitting up in a hospital room for two months holding her hand because the doctors could see in your eyes that the terms visiting hours don't apply to you. You don't know about real loss because that only occurs when you love something more than you love yourself. I doubt you've ever dared to love anybody that much. I look at you, I don't see an intelligent, confident man. I see a cocky, scared, shitless kid. But you're a genius, Will. No one denies that. No one could possibly understand the depths of you. But you presume to know everything about me because you saw a painting of mine. You ripped my fucking life apart. You're an orphan, right? Do you think I'd know the first thing about how hard your life has been? How you feel? Who you are? Because I read all of the twist. Does that encapsulate you? Personally, I don't give a shit about all that because you know what? I can't learn anything from you. I can't read in some fucking book. Unless you want to talk about you, who you are. And I'm fascinated. I'm in. But you don't want to do that, do you, sport? You're terrified of what you might say. You move, Chief. And yes, that was a little bit on the longer side of clips that we tend to use, but there was so much Mm. depth to it um, that we wanted to open with that one because for a a couple different reasons. One is this idea of you're just a kid. He realizes Will is just a kid. He wants to be a smart, confident man, but he's a cocky, scared, shitless kid. And (laughs) I don't know about you, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I am frequently scared shitless, <laughs> but the face and the persona I put out there is smart and confident. I know what I'm doing. I'm, I got this. No problem. And, and what Sean does and, and really what God does is say, okay, well, if you're going to bring me your, your religious pose, your front, your, Here's what I think I'm supposed to say. I don't care. But if you're going to really, if you're going to tell me, if you're going to disclose who you are, if you're going to be real, if you're going to talk. And I'm fascinated. I'm all in. And Will had never had anybody talk to him like that. Because really, Sean had taken his best shot. And he's like, oh, I'll come back. And so in this, this picture, this image, we need somebody to help us as we navigate that, the gifting with the trauma. Um, we need somebody to actually see us, right? He, he actually sees Will. Sean sees Will in a way that has never been, nobody had ever seen him. He called him out and he's like, oh, you actually hit it on the head. Normally they were so busy defending their position or kind of answering his questions. And I mean, in a lot of ways, Will's attacks that they hadn't had time to sort of put that aside and just say, well, where's that coming from? Yeah. So he does so many great things in that (laughs) speech. Like it's, it's so deep. And we've talked about this before about how stories have depth and are complex Whereas, you know, theology is just complicated and, and you can be very intelligent and deal with complication. Like intelligent people love complication because it makes them look smarter than you. I'm just saying that's what, that's what smart people do. And, and, and you know, all the right words and you know, all the right terminology and religion is just as good at that as anybody. And reading all the right books and watching all the right movies or what, whatever it might be, right? Whatever that culture tries to get you to do, 
But what, what Sean calls out is life isn't meant to be read about. It's meant to be lived. Like the reason why those are great books and the reason why we know about the Sistine Chapel is because the experience of them speaks to something within us that's human mm -hmm. and deep. And instead of just quoting about it, you don't even have the, ex you, you can't relate to the experience of it because you have hid, he calls him out for hiding. Just like yeah. the third servant, right? Given the talents by the master in the parable, he just hid it. Now, here it is. I give it back to you. I'm, I'll just tread water here. And, and Will was intelligent enough that he had built this very, what he thought was a safe life. And here, and here is Sean, mm. who was the first one who took, like you said, it was great, who took Will's best shot and didn't give up on him. So that's number one. He took Will's best shot and didn't give up on him. Number two, he called him out for being a coward. He called him out for being a coward. And, and challenged him, not on his intelligence, but on the fact that just because you know books doesn't mean you know life. That's not wisdom. Anybody, a parrot, you can teach a parrot to regurgitate something. Like, that's not wisdom. And then, but he also did two other things, which this is, all of this is important for us when we deal with ourselves and when we deal with other people. It, it, Yes, we should challenge the culture. We should challenge other people. We should challenge people. But he didn't do it apart from love. Because what Sean, what Sean did was he said, he's saying, I'm challenging you and I'm pushing back at you because I love you. That's what he did. That's, that was that whole speech. Yeah. He said, you, you're intelligent. You're more intelligent than anybody. Okay. You're a genius. You have this amazing gift. And number two, I not, but it's more than just your gift. I want to know you as a person. I want to be intimate. So there's purpose and intimacy. So hmm. he calls him to the two things every person wants. If I haven't gone over this in the podcast, I probably have. But every person, every person, because we have been made in the image of God, we all desire two things, intimacy and purpose, period. Now, we, we, we get it the wrong way oftentimes, but that's what we long for. And so, therefore, he calls him to intimacy. He calls him to purpose. And he challenges him that he doesn't have either. Right. He challenges him. His challenge isn't just you're an idiot and you're just a stupid kid and I hate you. His challenge is you don't have what truly satisfies you. And I'm willing to stick it with you even though you've been a jerk to me. Yeah. And God does the same with me <laughs> and God does the same with you. <laughs> and we should do the same with ourselves, give ourselves a little grace and say, okay, we've made our mistakes. We've hidden our gift, whatever we've done. Like, let's start. Let's, there's no better time than now. And so there's so much in that. And I love books, but again, the only <laughs> books aren't life. They, they can help us with life, but they aren't living life, you know? Yeah. And I love, basically, he said, you've got this illusion of a safe life. Mm -hmm. You've created this illusion. But the, th the thing is, it is an illusion because those, that, that shell, that framework will be shattered and shaken at some point. And that's what we see with Will is, and, and what Sean is actually doing, like you said, is inviting him. You think you know this, you think you know this, but you don't know it till you've experienced it. You know, one of my, one of my best friends, his dad passed away last night and you can read all the books you want on grief and you can say, yeah, you know, he's a believer. I know I'm going to see him in heaven. He's fully restored, but that doesn't take away from the grief, the sorrow that he's got, the, the, it, this, again, this, this juggling, the, the, the gifting with the trauma and the orphan. And, and what I, what I really loved is at the end, he's like, you presume to know me because you've read all these books. 
But if I did that to you, you would hate it. Right. Like if you'll drop the shell, if you'll drop the pose, if you'll drop that false self, that mask you're wearing and let me in, I would love to hear about who you are. But sort of like when we talked about with arrival is you've got to come. I'm not going to force you. I'm not going to come all I'm that way. Force it. And so the next several scenes, you actually see him where they're sitting there in complete silence. They're not doing anything. They're not speaking. They're not. He's like, Oh, I'm not wasting my time. He's like, and will, er, and Sean says, I don't, I know. All I know is that I can't be the first one to talk. It has to be from Will. There's a couple more scenes. And then we we're going to go to this next one where again, it's another session, but Will decides to start talking. Well, okay. So a, a couple of things. An, another thing that he does in that speech along the water is he says, he's, he is the first person to tell Will and to prove to Will that he has something Will doesn't. Hmm. I've been through things and Will's been through things, right? And the other thing, like you said, he turned it back around. He, he didn't just say, if I did that to you, if I read Oliver Twist and thought I knew you completely, you'd hate it. He did. He, he, what he's actually saying, what he actually said was, I love you so much. I would never do that to you. Like he, th- that was the contrast. Like, look what you did to me. I would never do that to you. Right. Because I know, I know better. <laughs> right. You don't know better. Right. Because like with a, with a rescue dog or a foster kid, when all they know is trauma, all they've known right. is abuse, they don't feel safe. And so the, the thing that Sean is most concerned about is making will feel safe he could say or do anything and he's in a safe space he has to respond by choice and i love that which is where we're going to get to in the scene i have been late you know really good big for time. you big time big time right? Um, i went on a date last week how'd it go it was good Going out again? I don't know. Why not? I haven't called her. Christ, you're an amateur. I know what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> don't worry about me. I know what I'm doing. Yeah, but this girl is like, you know, beautiful. She's smart. She's fun. It's different from most of the girls I've been with. So call her up, Romeo. Why? So I can realize she's not that smart, that she's fucking boring. You know what I mean? You don't... This girl is like fucking perfect right now. I don't ruin that. Maybe you're perfect right now. Maybe you don't want to ruin that. But I think that's a super philosophy, Will. That way you can go through your entire life without ever having to really know anybody. My wife used to fart when she was nervous. She had all sorts of wonderful little <laughs> idiosyncrasies. You know, she used to fart in the sleep. <laughs> I'm sorry I shared that with you. One night it was so loud it woke the dog up. <laughs> she woke up and got like, oh, was that you? I said, yeah, I didn't have the heart to tell her. <laughs> oh, God. She, she woke herself up. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Christ. Ah, but Will, she's been dead two years, and that's the shit I remember. <laughs> it's wonderful stuff, you know? Little things like that. Yeah, but those are the things I miss the most. The little idiosyncrasies that only I knew about. That's what made her my wife. Oh, and she had the goods on me, too. She knew all my little peccadilloes. People call these things imperfections, but they're not. Oh, that's the good stuff. And then we get to choose who we let into our weird little worlds. You're not perfect, sport. And let me save you the suspense. This girl you met, she isn't perfect either. But the question is whether or not you're perfect for each other. That's the whole deal. That's what intimacy is all about. Now, you can know everything in the world, sport, but the only way you're finding out that one is by giving it a shot. You certainly won't learn from an old fucker like me. Even if I did know, I wouldn't tell a piss ant like you. (laughs) 
Uh, why not? You told me every other fucking thing. <laughs> Jesus Christ. If I can talk more than any shrink I ever seen in my life. I teach this shit. I didn't say I know how to do it. <laughs> yeah. You ever think about getting remarried? My wife's dead. Hence the word remarried. She's dead. Well, I think that's a super philosophy, Sean. I mean, that way you could actually go through the rest of your life without ever really knowing anybody. Time's up. So about uh, about 33 minutes in, when we are introduced to Sean, he's teaching at a community college. Like he he was a really smart guy and he went to this big school and he know that's he's friends with the other professor who's at MIT. But whatever has happened in his life, he's kind of at this community college and the kids are bored. And, you know, it's just if you've been if I have been to a community college, have you ever been there? It's pretty legit. And (laughs) but his lecture was about trust. Yeah. And his lecture was about if you don't have trust, the most important thing to have is trust. And, and I, and I love that. I noticed that this time I was watching through it, that that's what he does with Will. He, he starts by being vulnerable. Sean starts by being vulnerable. He starts by building that trust and, and then, but, but waiting for Will to reciprocate. Right. And, and that is such a great scene. Again, this this idea, this idea that uh, this this illusion of the safe life that we pursue. He's like, I don't want to call her. She's perfect. I don't want her. I don't want maybe she's not as good as I remember. Maybe she's not as perfect. But what Sean says. Maybe you're just scared she's going to realize you're not perfect. And that idea that we've. There's, there's people out there because we talk a lot about community and brotherhood and all this. There are guys out there who's like, I can't find it. I can't find it. I don't have it. And they get panicky and, and worked up and feel like they're going to, they're at a loss because they don't have that. When it could be that you have it, you just don't recognize it for what it is because you, you don't receive it. You're not ready for, for what that looks like. Because it's in those imperfections. It's in the stuff that we don't want to share with other people that actually makes us who we are. And as you mentioned, that that dichotomy, that 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 the tension between, and I don't even it's not really tension, but here it is between purpose and intimacy. Yeah. And as you mentioned, Jerry, the per, the math professor, wants to get him ready pursuing his purpose. And Sean's like, no, he's not ready. He's, he's not capable. He's do, he needs this under, he needs to understand intimacy. He can't pursue his purpose unless he's got that grounding of that foundation. And that's how we are. We've got to find our, our, we've got, our hearts have to be healed before that we can, we can become anything great. And I don't mean, yeah. you know, before we could ha- achieve all the glory and grandeur that you you think you want. And it's what I told my wife a few weeks ago. Um, as we're, we're talking about, you know, I, I want to write a book. I want, we've got the podcast. I want to grow the podcast. But I told her, I was like, I, I don't think I'm ready. I, I don't think I can handle success in a way that I would be healthy. Like I want to, I want to be able to, I want to make sure that I've, fathered my children well that i've grandfathered my my grandchildren well it's like i want to be sure that if and when the success from writing or whatever comes that i'm able to handle that in a way that would not sort of leave my family in the dust and that's what sean is doing here as he's mentoring him and discipling him but the important thing is maybe you find yourself in the Sean stage where you have younger men that are coming to you and talking to you, or you've got your, you're in Sean stage and you're saying no to these other guys. Cause they're sort of a waste of your time. They take a lot of time. They're not really, 
they're 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 a pain in the ass. But as you see at the end, like I love that scene because it bookends. That's a super philosophy, Sean. <laughs> right? Is because they're 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 mirroring it back to each other. And we focus a lot on Will and at the end how he leaves his little one bedroom apartment type thing. Yeah. But so does Sean. Like Sean has been out of teaching. He's been out of counseling since his wife got sick years ago. And now he's teaching because he's, he shut he's shut himself off in a very similar way to will. And I think that's where they see, because I think they see each other or Sean sees himself in will and wants to say, no, you've got to come out. And at the same time, Will's like, wait, you're doing the same thing. Yep. Because it's not just the teacher. That's the bestowing of information and wisdom. There's a reciprocal relationship in that relate in, in that. And there has to be, if, if you've ever taught legitimately taught things, if you've ever had those sort of mentor mentee relationships with anybody, I've been both. Right. I, I've been the guy who was younger and was mentored by my, I call him the father, my father in the faith, Larry Trammell. And he helped me in so many ways because he had gone before me. He had jumped through the hurdles and done the things and, and he could help me navigate a lot of things. And when Beck and I got married, Larry and his wife, Alice, were instrumental in helping us have a great marriage in those first couple, couple of years, laying that foundation because we could come to them and all that stuff. And, and I've been the mentor, right? I've had other people in my life that young men that I've been able to teach and, and have relationship with. And it always takes time. That's another thing I love about this movie because it happened in, in Arrival too, is the world wants us to speed these things up. And, and sometimes God slows this stuff down, man. It's like we have this urgency sometimes that, that's different than God's urgency. God does have an urgency, but it's a different sort of urgency than ours. Sometimes what happens suddenly, at least it would seem like they happen suddenly, but, but there was a lot of preparation that goes on. And, and we just have to, realize some of that, but also as being the mentor myself, I had to be patient because as the mentor, you want to, sh- you do want to be like the other MIT professor. You want to shake the kid and make him do what's what he needs to do. Cause you see it and he doesn't. And instead you have to be patient. Like I have had so many times when God's like, just leave him alone and let me deal with him. Right. Where I'm like, if this kid would just, and God's like, leave him alone. <laughs> Let me deal with him. That, that doesn't mean that I don't ever, you know, talk to anybody or, or never said anything or challenged anything. But I had to let the process work. You know, the Bible talks about planting a seed. Like the word of God is like a seed. Yeah. And, and it grows first to shoot. And then it's like there's a process. Like the word of God will produce life. You, you just have to keep planting the seeds and then be patient and just let the kingdom do the work. Let the kingdom do the work because I can't do it anyway. And so, and, and as, as long, as well as being the mentor, I have had to grow. Those have been some of the, my biggest times of growth is when I'm the one who has to kind of share. And it's like, oh, I don't feel ready for this. You know, I, I don't think, I don't know that you ever feel ready, but, but I have to grow. This pushes me to do yeah. better, to be more, to do more and to, to make sure I'm more connected to the spirit. So I don't mess this up. Right. Or whatever it is. Like there's all these things. And so I, I love that part of the movie too, that, that Sean, by the end of the movie, by the way, there, when, when Will first kind of really challenges him with about the painting and hurts him and just kind of totally rips him apart. The picture we see, it's a show don't tell moment. The picture we see of Sean 
is home alone with a drink, right? Like, you're right. He has, in his grief, closed himself off, right? And so, so yes, this relationship is also something that he needs. And I think that we need to understand, when, when, when I call men to mentor others, I'm saying you need this as much as the other guy does. Yeah. You need this too. Like, this isn't just for him. This is for both of you because it is reciprocal, like you said. And frequently, it's less of a hierarchy and more of a walking through life together. Right. And that's really what you see is in in Sean and, and Will is they're just, Sean is inviting Will into his life. He's like, here's it. it and really into a, almost an expression of, of his grief. And so that that's one sort of dynamic we need as, as the orphan who experiences, who has both great gifting and great tragedy and trauma in our lives. We need the inner intervention of a father figure to come rescue us to, you know, the, the picture of the, the prodigal son who's, who's running out on the road as his son's covered in pig shit and just shame of years of wasting his father's inheritance inheritance of even saying, I wish you were dead. Give me my money now. Mm. And yet, and, and that's what you see with Will is get away from me. Get away from me. You don't know where yeah. I've been. You don't know what I've done. You don't know what I've seen. You don't know what I've experienced that, that I, that what Sean talked about in that first, ex, first thing is I don't know you, but I want to. And if there's something that's going to freak Will out, it's I want to know you. And so now you've got that image of the the father of Sean, and now we're going to sh- slide over to the the Skyler. Well, just what, one quick note: we need both. I need, and I do have still. I, I have all three of these characters in my life, <laughs> right? right? I need, I need, and there's a fourth, but I need a mentor who's been there before me. I have several in my life. I've never done 16, 14, and 12 with my children before. But I know other men who have, right? So I have men in my life who have gone before me. But sometimes, sometimes to connect with the Father's love, you have to be a father to somebody else. Sometimes for you to really understand the father's heart, you have to participate in being a father to somebody else. So I need to mentor others. I need to pour into others. But I also have friends, peers, where we pour into each other, right? I have that too, right? And I have a woman. And all four you have of these. A lover. I got a lover. <laughs> what are you doing, Will Ferrell? Is that Will Ferrell in the hot tub? In the hot tub. Um, no, yes. So, but all four of these people do the same thing with me that that the three people, because Will doesn't really mentor anybody in this yet. But but uh, although we could say the fourth is the Sean to Will, right? But all four, of, because Will does the same thing back to Sean. He sees more in Sean than Sean sees him is, is in himself as well. He sees yeah. more that Sean could be doing. Like he sees a purpose that Sean isn't living too. As much as he's being fathered by Sean, he sees that too. And my point is all four of those people in my life, see, they see more in me than I see in myself. And I do the same thing to them. I see more in them. Like that's that's our job in the body of Christ is to see more in each other than we see in ourselves. Because it's so hard, it's almost impossible for us to see it in ourselves. I think it might be impossible for us to see it in ourselves. We see in a mirror darkly, right? Right. We need (laughs) the Father to speak over us, to speak the Father over us, the, the the God, the Father, and we need other voices of the Father through the woman through the friend, through the mentor, through being a mentee, whatever. We need, we need all those voices to confirm, to say the same thing. Because they were all saying the same thing in the movie. Skyler and everybody, yeah. they're all saying the same thing. 
I want to know you. I want to be with you. And I believe in you. Um, and it's hard for us to get it sometimes when you're an orphan. And C.S. Lewis talks about this in The Four Loves, about the importance of friendship, that, that friendship love. And I can't remember the term of it. But what he says is when you have that, that those people bring out a different dimension. Like you and I, when we have a conversation, we bring out a certain dimension in each, in each other. Sure. And when we invite a third person in, not only does that other person pull out that dimension from me and from you, but then I can see that different dimension in you. Right. Good. And so we talk, it, it's really easy to say, oh, I just want this safe little two guys meet, three guys meet. But when you're all sort of walking in the same direction, caring about the same things, wanting to lead your family well, wanting to grow in relationship. Yeah, there might be some aspects that might be imperfect, might be uncomfortable. We were sitting around the fire last week and, and one guy was like, is there anything you don't know about? Because he's talking about the different milk from cows and all this stuff. And it's just like, yeah, but. You know, because when we talk about sports, he doesn't know that he knows hunting and outdoorsmen and some of the guys can talk about football or baseball or basketball, you know. And so that's why it's important to have that capacity. We'll talk about Chucky here at the end, mm -hmm. because as he said, he's like, oh, no, I got it. it talking about Skylar, the, the woman, the female interest, the lover. <laughs> and so we've got the relationship with Skylar and he does call her back and they develop the relationship to the point where Skylar is going to invite Will to go with her to California. And the reaction that this causes is something that Sean couldn't do mm -hmm. because Sean couldn't engage that part of Will right. that Skylar does. Right. And what this scene does as he reacts to her invitation Remember, he's he's holding on. He's he's used his genius to create this illusion of a safe life. And the illusion is starting to crumble because he actually does care about her. But he's just can't let go of the illusion by at the end of the scene. I want you to come to California. You sure about that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, but how do you know? I don't know. I just know. Yeah, but how, how do you know? I know because I feel it. Because that's a really serious thing you say. I mean, I, I know. You could be in California next week and, you know, you might find out something about me you don't like and. You know, maybe you wish you hadn't said that, but you know, it's such a serious thing that you can't take it back. And now I'm stuck in California. Someone doesn't really want to be with me. Just wish they had a take back. What? What's the take back? I don't want a take back. I just want you to come to California with me. Well, I can't go to California with you, so. Why not? Uh, one, because I, I, I've got a job here. And two, because I live here. Look, um, if you don't love me, you should just tell me I'm because it's I such a... I love you. Then why? Why won't you come? What are you so scared of? What am I so scared of? Well, what aren't you scared of? You live in the safe little world where no one challenges you and you're scared shitless oh, no. to do don't, anything don't, else. Because don't that tell me about my world. Don't tell me about my world. I mean, you just want to have your little fling with, like, the guy from the other side of town. Then you're going to go off to Stanford. You're going to marry some rich prick who your parents will approve of and just sit around with the other trust fund babies and talk about how you went slumming too once. Why are you saying this? What is your obsession with this money? My father died when I was 13 and I inherited this money. You don't think every day I wake up and I wish that I could give it back? That I would give it back in a second if it meant I could have one more day with him. But I can't, then that's my life and I deal with it. So don't put your shit on me when you're the one that's afraid. I'm afraid. What, what, what am I afraid of? What the fuck am I afraid of? You're afraid of? of me. You're afraid that I won't love you back. You know what? I'm afraid too. 
Fuck it, I want to give it a shot, and at least I'm honest with you. No, I'm not honest with you. No, what about your 12 brothers? Right. No, you're not going. You're not leaving. What do you want to know? What? That I don't have 12 brothers? Yeah. That I'm a fucking orphan? Yeah. No, you don't want to hear I that. Didn't know no, that. you don't want to hear that. You don't want to hear that I got it. fucking cigarettes put out of me when I was a little kid. I didn't know that, that this isn't fucking surgery, that the motherfucker stabbed me. You don't want to hear that shit, Skylar. I don't do don't hear tell that. me you want to hear that I shit. I want to hear it because I want to help you because I want to be with you. What the fuck? What do I got? A fucking sign on my back that says save me? No. Do I look like I need that? No, God, I just want to be with don't you because bullshit. I love you. Don't bullshit me. I don't you fucking bullshit me. I love you. I want to hear you say that you don't love me. Because if you say that, then I won't call you. And I won't be in your life. I don't love you. And that is a painful scene. And it's hard for me because I felt like Will a lot of times. And we, we've, we've talked about this before a lot of, if you really knew me, you would love me. And that's what he's scared of. If I get out of, if I leave Boston, his shit job with his shit apartment, he's <laughs> like, I live here. It's like, no. You live in somebody's like living room or something. Yeah. Yeah. Like you could, you should be happy to be leaving. You know, you're working at a demo job that Chucky got for you. Like you've got nothing that you can't let leave. But what he says is, and like I said, he, she, her invitation reels reveals something, even as she's using the same language Sean has used. I want to give it a shot. What are you scared of? And she even says, you're scared shitless. And I love how she was using the same language Sean used, but it was pulling something else out of him. He's something he believed. He believed she didn't want to hear about his traumatic past. And we believe that too. Yeah. And that keeps us from intimacy. Yeah. And when we don't get intimacy, we can't find our part. We can't fulfill it. Not with any real meaning. And, and I just, I, it's such a great sort of arc within the movie, but Skylar is a huge part of that. And because he does long for that that level of intimacy. She she sees him naked in a way no one else does. So that's a whole nother level of afraid, you know. Like I don't know, you know what? And and it's such a and such a great scene. And and it is painful because she challenges him, and it goes back to what we keep saying about these movies. When guys write these movies and these women challenge them, <laughs> like they're, they're like that's what we want. We want a woman who will stand up to us and stand with us. We want both. Um, who, someone who will stand up to us to, to encourage us to be the best that we're able to be. That's who we want. Someone who says, you're better than this. Yeah. And as hurtful as that can be sometimes, it's, it's actually loving to say you're yeah. better than this. Right. Um, and that's what she does. And, and that, you know, and that, that kind of, that's kind of a crisis moment where, Kind of where we're getting to the final part where, you know, he, he's almost ready to just accept the safe life again. And he's having that conversation with Chucky and uh, and we all need friends. And he thought Chucky was safe, which is why this is such a great scene. He thought Chucky was safe, like he could manipulate Chucky and he could, you know, whatever. But what Chucky says to him is such a great. So how's your lady? Ah, she's gone. Gone, gone where? Uh, med school, medical school in California. Really? Yeah. What was this? It's like a week ago. Well, that sucks. So uh, when are you done with those meetings? Like the week after I'm 21. Yeah, they're gonna hook you up with a job or what? Yeah, fucking sit in a room and do long division for the next 50 years. Yeah, probably make some nice bank though. Gonna be a fucking lab rat. Better than this shit. Way out of here. Oh, no 
don't want a way out of here for. I mean, I'm going to fucking live here the rest of my life. You know, be neighbors, you know, we'll have little kids, fucking take them a little league together up Foley Field. Look, you're my best friend, so don't take this the wrong way. But in 20 years, if you're still living here, coming over to my house to watch the Patriots game, still working construction, I'll fucking kill you. That's not a threat. What? That's a fact. I'll fucking kill you. What the fuck are you talking about? Look, you got something none of us. Oh, come on. Why, why is it always this? I mean, I fucking owe it to myself to do this or that. What if I don't no, want to? No, no, no. No, fuck you. You don't owe it to yourself. You owe it to me. Because tomorrow I'm going to wake up and I'll be 50. And I'll still be doing this shit. And that's all right. That's fine. I mean, you're sitting on a winning lottery ticket. You're too much of a pussy to cash it in. And that's bullshit. Because I'd do fucking anything to have what you got. So would any of these fucking guys. It'd be an insult to us if you're still here in 20 years. Hanging around here is a fucking waste of your time. You don't know that. I don't? No. You don't know no, that. No, I don't know that. Let me tell you what I do now. Every day I come by your house and I pick you up. We go out, we have a few drinks and a few laughs, and it's great. You know what the best part of my day is? It's for about 10 seconds from when I pull up to the curb when I get to your door. Because I think maybe I'll get up there and I'll knock on the door and you won't be there. No goodbye, no see you later, no nothing. I'm just left. I don't know much, but I know that. And we all need a Chucky. Right? Because he's manipulated. Will has manipulated this illusion of a safe life. And he's like, ah, Chucky, I'm just going to sit here. We'll watch our kids play T-ball and go to Foley Field. He's like, I'll fucking kill you. <laughs> <laughs> like, if that's it, because he knows that his friend is wasting his purpose. He's like, I'm your best friend. And even I know that if you're doing this in 20 years, you've wasted your, your lottery ticket. You've wasted your ticket out of here. You've wasted your gift. You've wasted your life. And nobody wants to do that. Nobody wants to look back and feel like they wasted their life. And Chucky knows, he's like, yeah, this is my life and I'm okay with it. Because this is what I'm supposed to do. But you're not. And I always think that's weird that it's like, you know what? My, my dream is that my best friend up and leaves without even saying goodbye or nothing. Right. Like, that's kind of weird, but whatever. And, and it goes back to that, you know, his, his fear, like he knows Chucky has gotten to the point where, like you said, he thought Chucky was safe because he, what he said to Skylar is you might find out something you don't like. Well, Chucky knows everything. Right. So he's not afraid. Like, and that's what, uh, Sean talks about with Jerry is his friends. Those guys would all take a bullet for him. Yeah. And he would take a bullet for them. And you don't. And so for someone in that circle to challenge him and say, no, this is this great. Wait, you had a good thing. Like they love Skylar. Right. Cause she could hang out with the boys. It was almost like a Wendy and the lost boys sort of thing. Yeah, man. She could she hang could totally with them for it. sure. That, that horrible joke she tells. <laughs> and and she, they're just like, ah, that sucks. He's like, oh, we thought she was going to be enough. She was going to, you know, be the knight in shining armor and sweep Will out of there. And Chucky's like, I guess it's up to me. I got to get you out of here. Like, you can't do that. I don't care about you. You owe it to me. Because you got something I would kill for. Right. And just, and that's how Jer, uh, Jerry, the, the math professor, he's like, I don't want you to throw your life away. You've got, you do things I wish I could. Yeah. Right. It's like, um, Amadeus, the, the, oh, right. uh, like, I wish I had Mozart, that talent. I wish whatever, I had that yeah. gift of Mozart. Yeah. Well, here's what his friend wanted. It wasn't that his friend didn't want to ever see him again. Right. His friend wanted to be inspired by him. That's what his friend wanted. He's like, you, what, it sounds a little selfish, but for you to have a gift and to not use it, like you have the ability to inspire people with your gift. You actually have the ability to give people hope. 
Because, see, Chucky lives in this loop. And he's like, I'm going to just live in the loop. This is my life. But people need to know that you can escape the loop. People need to see that you can escape the matrix. You can escape the, you can get out of the, the, the rut. They, 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 they're inspired. No one watches the movie where nothing happens to the person. They just do the same thing every day, right? They, we want to be inspired by these stories. This is why we do men at the movies. This is why we watch these movies. We, we want to be inspired by someone doing, Ordinary people doing extraordinary things or whatever. We want to see someone we can relate to doing something extraordinary, taking a risk, being forced to take a risk, whatever it might be, overcoming what seems impossible. We, we want to see that. And that's why these movies make money because we that's what they do. They show people that. And there's little there's literal data involved, like. They don't do it as much anymore because in the streaming world, it just, just doesn't happen. But in the olden days, like 10, 15, 20 years ago, <laughs> they would have what they call, like they would test it. So a, a movie, they, they do, a director would cut a version of the movie and then they test it in front of an audience and they do, they ask them questions and they test it and see. And so like they changed the end of Pretty in Pink for this reason. You know, they tested it because she ends up with Ducky in the movie in the in the original cut, and nobody liked it. They wanted him. They wanted her to end up with the Blaine guy. They wanted him. They wanted the princess fairy tale ending. So they literally had the dude come back, Andrew McCarthy come back. Is why he's got a wig on at the end because they had to reshoot the whole <laughs> ending. But this is my point is that, th that this is why we love these movies. Like we love this stuff. We, this is what we want to see. And that's what his friend wanted from him. His friend is like, you, you mean you could be inspiring me and you're, you're quitting? Screw you. Like yeah. that, 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 that pisses me off that you could be inspiring people with doing the impossible and using this amazing gift. And you're just not going to do it. And, and that you owe it to me, <laughs> right? I need to be inspired, inspire me. And, um, and, and I love, I love the, that arc and the fact that in the end, when he decides to go, they get him a car, you know, and it's a crappy little car, but whatever, like it's such love, you know, there's so much love in that. Um, and, and I think the only other thing that we haven't really touched on was how Sean, by the end of the movie, calls him son. He starts out with calling yeah. him chief. And in the end, again, because those relationships take time, you, it's not going to happen overnight. You're not going to. Paul and Timothy didn't become like father and son overnight in the scripture. That happened over time. I didn't have a father in the faith overnight. It took many times of me going over to his house without knocking. <laughs> and, 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 and his wife, Alice, looking at me one time, she goes, you know, you're the only person who comes over to this house and doesn't knock first. And I thought, I was like, oh, I'm so sorry. I thought it was, offend like, it was offensive. I was, she was like, no, it's, it's okay. You're, you're family. Like, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, I get annoyed when some of my friends come over. It's like, you've known me long enough. You can just come in. Just come in, right? What are you waiting for? Um, <laughs> so, good. And so as we wrap, yes. We are going to wrap up a, 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 an episode of Goodwill Hunting without playing It's Not Your Fault. Yep. <laughs> Executive decision. We made it. Yeah. Because we thought that this was, this was what we needed. This idea of what discipleship looks like, of mentoring, of how to find it. And the, the fact that how these three different, a, a trinity, as it were, engage to rescue Will's heart. Because it needed all three aspects. All three characters were necessary. Yep. And as we said, and it's not just this pitiful little orphan boy with a genius, because he's having a positive impact on the others. You know, whether it's it's Sean or Skylar or Chucky, he's encouraging them, he's uplifting them, he's giving them an, a new vision and a new outlook on life. And that's that reciprocal relationship that we find. And the last, I guess, question that I have for our listeners, 
is where do you have that illusion of a safe little life? Where are you trying to sort of stash it away and just make sure that nothing bad ever happens? Versus this idea of, I had, I had somebody ask me, it's like, if you had a perfect life, would you know it? Not what does a perfect life look like, although that's probably a pretty good question to ask yourself. But for Will, you know, his life was, oh no, this is all I want. And you're like, no, because you're never going to accomplish your purpose or, and you're never going to achieve intimacy that, that you actually are craving the most. It's like your, your gifts, it has to come out. Those cravings have to come out. And how are they, they going to be expressed in, in uh, good ways or bad ways? Yeah, good. And I can't remember who said it, uh, but he said, if we deal, if we leave our trauma unaddressed, we will use it to inflict trauma on those around yeah, us. We'll pass it on. Yeah. Yeah. We'll pass on our trauma and and it might not be the same way, but you see it in Will's interactions with, especially with, with Sean early. And then with Skylar, he's passing on, he's hurting her when he says, I don't love you. He is passing on his pain to her. And that's, she calls him out on it. He's like, don't put your shit on me. But if we leave that trauma unaddressed, that is what we're going to do. So if you guys are listening and you're like, oh, there's some stuff that keeps coming up for me, find a therapist, find a counselor, find somebody. There's lots of them out there. Um, and especially coming off this, this two years of trauma in the pandemic. Um, we definitely, we don't want to pass on our trauma and we need the intervention of really the intervention of God through people to accomplish our, uh, the restoration of our heart. Yep. Yeah. My, my, the only thing I got to leave everybody with is just be that person that sees more in others than they see in themselves. Mm. And it takes, you have to be intentional about that. You have to be trying, but if you just look and ask God to show you, you will see the value, the winning lottery ticket that everybody is around you and just call it out. Keep calling it out. And, and it, it, it will challenge people. I've, I've done it, but it's not a challenge as if like, eh, you got to do better. It's you're better than this. You have so much more than this. And I, I want, I believe in you. I want to see it. You know, not everyone will respond the right way, but that's the kind of love I think that we should be with each other. And, um, and really that's on them and not on you. Right. So this has been Paul McDonald and Britt Mooney talking about goodwill hunting. Britt, it's not your fault. <sighs> Thanks man. No, no, it's, it's not your fault. Look at me. <laughs> look at me, son. I love that line. <laughs> Look at me. He says, look at me, son. I love that. <laughs> so I hope you enjoyed it. And I hope that you guys join us next time here on the Men at the Movies podcast. Something inside has been awakened. I can no longer be who I was before. But if I am no longer who I was, who am I to be? Who am I to be?